Basic English Wiki Youngsters Welcome to my YouTube channel IELTS International English Language Testing System IELTS Listening Practice 1 Audio Scripts Let's start Listen and read Speak carefully to prepare your IELTS test. Before giving the test, you have to try to read, listen and speak so that you can understand everything. Be ready. Test 1. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between two friends, called George and Nina, about a summer music festival. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 and 2. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hi, George. Glad you're back. Loads of people have phoned you. Really? I felt just like your secretary. Sorry. I went into the library this afternoon to have a look at a newspaper and I came across something really interesting. What? A book? No, a brochure from a summer festival, mainly Spanish music. Look, I've got it here. George says that he found a brochure from a festival, so B has been circled as the answer. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 and 2. Hi, George. Glad you're back. Loads of people have phoned you. Really? I felt just like your secretary. Sorry. I went into the library this afternoon to have a look at a newspaper and I came across something really interesting. What? A book? No, a brochure from a summer festival, mainly Spanish music. Look, I've got it here. Spanish music? I really love the guitar. Let's have a look. So what's this group, uh, Guitarini? They're really good. They had a video with all the highlights of the festival at a stand in the lobby to the library, so I heard them. They play fantastic instruments, drums and flutes and old kinds of guitars. I've never heard anything like it before. Sounds great. OK, shall we go then? Spoil ourselves? Yes, let's. The only problem is there aren't any cheap seats. It's all one price. Huh. Well, in that case, we could sit right at the front. We'd have a really good view. Yeah, though I think that if you sit at the back, you can actually hear the whole thing better. Mm, yes. Anyway, we can decide when we get there. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 3 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 3 to 10. So will you fill in the form or shall I? I'll do it. Name, George O'Neill. Address, 48 North Avenue, West Sea. Do you remember our new postcode? Still can't remember it. Mm, just a minute. I've got it written down here. Ah, WS6. 2YH. Do you need the phone too? Please. I'm really bad at numbers. 01674 553 So let's book two tickets for Guitarini. Okay. If you're sure 750 each is all right, how do you feel about the singer? Mm, I haven't quite decided. But I've noticed something on the booking form that might just persuade me. What's that then? Free refreshments. Really? Yes, look here. Sunday, 17th of June. Singer. Ticket, six pounds, includes drinks in the garden. Sounds like a bargain to me. <laughs> yes. Let's book two tickets for that. So, what else? I'm feeling quite keen now. How about the pianist on the 22nd of June? Anna Ventura. I've just remembered that's my evening class night. Mm, that's okay. I'll just have to go on my own. But we can go to the Spanish dance and guitar concert together, can't we? Yes, I'm sure Tom and Kieran would enjoy that too. Good heavens, £10.50 a ticket. I can see we're going to have to go without food for the rest of the week. <laughs> we'll need to book four. Oh, wish we were students. Look, children, students and senior citizens get a 50% discount on everything. If only. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You will hear the education officer of a dinosaur museum giving information to some teachers who are planning a school visit. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hello, and thank you for asking me to your teacher's meeting to talk about the Dinosaur Museum and to tell you a bit about what you can do with your students there. Well, let me give you some of the basic information first. In regard to opening hours, we're open every day of the week from 9am to 8pm, except on Mondays, when we close at 1.30pm. And in fact, the only day in the year when we're closed is on the 25th of December. You can book a guided tour for your school group any time that we're open. If you bring a school group to the museum, when you arrive, we ask you to remain with your group in the car park. One or more of the tour guides will welcome you there and brief you about what the tour will be about. We do this there because our entrance is quite small and we really haven't got much room for briefing groups in the exhibition area. As far as the amount of time you'll need goes, if you bring a school group, you should plan on allowing a minimum of 90 minutes for the visit. This allows 15 minutes to get on and off the coach, 45 minutes for the guided tour and 30 minutes for after-tour activities. If you're going to have lunch at the museum, you will of course have to allow more time. There are two cafes in the museum with seating for 80 people. If you want to eat there, you'll need to reserve some seating as they can get quite crowded at lunchtime. Then, outside the museum, at the back, there are tables and students can bring their own lunch and eat it there in the open air. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. When the students come into the museum foyer, we ask them to check in their backpacks with their books, lunchboxes, etc. at the cloakroom before they enter the museum proper. I'm afraid in the past we have had a few things gone missing after school visits, so this is a strict rule. Also, some of the exhibits are fragile and we don't want them to be accidentally knocked. But we do provide school students with handouts with questions and quizzes on them. There's so much that students can learn in the museum and it's fun for them to have something to do. Of course, they'll need to bring something to write with for these. We do allow students to take photographs. For students who are doing projects, it's useful to make some kind of visual record of what they see that they can add to their reports. And finally, they should not bring anything to eat into the museum or drinks of any kind. There are also a few things that students can do after the tour. In the theatreette on the ground floor, there are continuous screenings of short documentaries about dinosaurs which they can see at any time. We used to have an activity room with more interactive things like making models of dinosaurs and drawing and painting pictures, even hunting for dinosaur eggs. But unfortunately, the room was damaged in a bad storm recently when water came in the roof, so that's closed at the moment. But we do have an IT centre where students have access to CD-ROMs with a range of dinosaur games. These games are a lot of fun, but they also teach the students about the lives of dinosaurs, how they found food, protected their habitat, survived threats, that kind of thing. And um, I think that's all I have to tell you. Please feel free to ask any questions if you would like to know anything else. About that is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between an English teacher called Paul and a former student of his called Kira. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, Kira. How are you? Fine, thanks, Paul. How are you? Well, thanks. It's good to see you. It must be 12 months since you did our course. That's right. It's nice to come back and say hello. What course did you enrol in? Actually, I went straight into third year pharmacy. They credited me with two years, which probably made it more difficult for me. Hmm. On the other hand, you were lucky to be granted credits. Is that why you chose the course? Yes. And as I'd already finished a course in it in my country, I thought it would be easier if I studied something I already knew. I didn't realise you went into third year. I thought you started in first year. No wonder it was so hard. And what do you think is one of the big differences between studying at a university here and studying in your country? Well, I found it very difficult to write assignments because I wasn't familiar with that aspect of the system here. The main problem is that the lectures expect you to be critical. That made me feel really terrible. I thought, how can I possibly do it? How can I comment on someone else's research when they probably spent five years doing it? I think a lot of people who come from overseas countries have similar problems. But after a while, it became easier for me. People expect you to have problems with the process of reading and writing. But in fact, it is more a question of altering your viewpoint towards academic study. Hmm. Uh, how was the content of the lectures? Was it easy for you? I didn't really have many problems understanding lectures. The content was very similar to what I'd studied before. And what about the lecturers themselves? Are they essentially the same as lecturers in your country? Uh, well, actually, no. 
Here they're much easier to approach. After every lecture, you can go and ask them something you didn't understand. Or you can make an appointment and talk to them about anything in the course. Maybe you found them different because you're a more mature student now, whereas when you were studying in your country, you were younger and not so assertive. No, I don't think that's the difference. Hmm. Most of the students here do it. In my faculty, they all seem to make appointments, usually to talk about something in the course that's worrying them, but sometimes just about something that might really interest them, something they might want to specialize in. Hmm. The lecturers must set aside certain times every week when they're available for students. That's good to hear. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And how was your timetable? Was it a very busy year? Oh, very, very busy. They make you work very hard. Apart from lectures, we had practical sessions in a lot of subjects. We did these in small groups. I had to go and work four hours every week in a community pharmacy. Hmm. Actually, I enjoyed this very much, meeting new people all the time. Then in second semester, we had to get experience in hospital dispensaries. So every second day, we went to one of the big hospitals and worked there. And on top of all that, we had our assignments, which took me a lot of time. Oh, I nearly forgot. Between first and second semesters, we had to work full time for two weeks in a hospital. That does sound a very heavy year. So... Are you pleased now that you did it? Do you feel some sense of achievement? Yeah, I do feel much more confident, which I suppose is the most important thing. And have you got any recommendations for people who are studying from overseas? Well, I suppose they need very good English. It would be much better if they spent more time learning English before they enter the university, because you can be in big trouble if you don't understand what people are saying and you haven't got time to translate. Hmm. Uh, anything else? Well, as I said before, the biggest problem for me was lack of familiarity with the education system here. It sounds as if it was a real challenge. Congratulations, Kira. Thanks, Paul. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a talk about a project on the wildlife found in city gardens in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. Today I'd like to present the findings of our Year 2 project on wildlife found in gardens throughout our city. I'll start by saying something about the background to the project, then talk a little bit about our research techniques, and then indicate some of our interim findings. First of all, how did we choose our topic? Well, there are four of us in the group, and one day, while we were discussing a possible focus, two of the group mentioned that they had seen yet more sparrowhawks, one of Britain's most interesting birds of prey, in their own city centre gardens, and wondered why they were turning up in these gardens in great numbers. We were all very engaged by the idea of why wild animals would choose to inhabit a city garden. 
Why is it so popular with wildlife when the countryside itself is becoming less so? The first thing we did was to establish what proportion of the urban land is taken up by private gardens. We estimated that it was about one-fifth, and this was endorsed by looking at large-scale usage maps in the town land survey office, 24% to be precise. Our own informal discussions with neighbors and friends led us to believe that many garden owners had interesting experiences to relate regarding wild animal sightings. So we decided to survey garden owners from different areas of the city. Just over 100 of them completed a survey once every two weeks for 12 months, ticking off species they had seen from a pro forma list, and adding the names of any rarer ones. Meanwhile, we were doing our own observations in selected gardens throughout the city. We deliberately chose smaller ones because they were by far the most typical in the city. The whole point of the project was to look at the norm, not the exception. Alongside this primary research on urban gardens, we were studying a lot of books about the decline of wild animals in the countryside and thinking of possible causes for this. So what did we find? Well, so much that I just won't have time to tell you about here. If you're interested in reading our more comprehensive findings, we've produced detailed graphic representations on the college website, and, of course, any of the group would be happy to talk to you about them. Just email us. What we've decided to present today is information about just three species because we felt these gave a good indication of the processes at work in rural and urban settings as a whole. The first species to generate a lot of interesting information was frogs, and there was a clear pattern here. They proliferate where there is suitable water. Garden ponds are on the increase. Rural ponds are disappearing, leading to massive migration to the towns. Hedgehogs are also finding it easier to live in urban areas, this time because their predators are not finding it quite so attractive to leave their rural environment, so hedgehogs have a better survival rate in cities. We had lots of sightings, so all in all we had no difficulties with our efforts to count their numbers precisely. Our final species is the finest of bird singers, the song thrush. On the decline in the countryside, they are experiencing a resurgence in urban gardens because these days gardeners are buying lots of different plants, which means there's an extensive range of seeds around, which is what they feed on. Another factor is the provision of nesting places, which is actually better in gardens than the countryside. Hard to believe it, but it's true. Incidentally, we discovered that a massive new survey on song thrushes is about to be launched, so you should keep an eye open for that. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Dear viewers, write your feelings to the comment box of this video or my Facebook page, Halimsev. See you again with another video soon. Have a nice day. Wishing you a golden future. Thank you. Goodbye.